design and document your process to do what we call nail the handoff from the office to the field. When you do this, when you nail the handoff from the office to the field, this is going to eliminate the majority of the chaos and the profit leads and the schedule delays and the frustration on your job sites. If you're looking for the 80 for the 20, the 20% of the steps in your process that you can focus on that will give you 80% of the results, nailing the handoff is absolutely the place to start. Hey guys, Todd here. Welcome to the Construction Leading Edge podcast from constructionleadingedge.com. And we're going to talk about a pretty interesting t- topic today, a topic that you may think is pretty useless, pretty boring, but uh, here's the topic. How meetings helped win the war on Al-Qaeda. That's right. How effective meetings helped win the war on Al-Qaeda. So here are a few different things you're going to walk away from this podcast with. A different approach to team meetings that will revolutionize your business. There are some things that you're probably doing wrong with your meetings, which is why they suck and why you don't want to do them. You'll walk away with some best practices that'll help you and your team actually look forward to your meetings. You'll learn some strategies that made meetings help win the war on Al-Qaeda. You'll learn how you can use meetings to empower execution for your team and help to, quote, flip a switch in your team members. We'll talk about that some more in details in a few minutes. The connection between good team meetings and creating a culture of accountability. There are three crucial systems that you'll want to put in place in your construction business, especially if you want it to run without you, if you want to be the CEO of your business. And you'll hear from a construction business owner who's started implementing those crucial systems, and he'll discuss what life is like now. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about how meetings helped defeat Al-Qaeda. So here's the scene. It's early 2000s, 2003, 2004, and facing down Al-Qaeda in Iraq forced General Stanley McChrystal to change his approach and create more adaptable teams. Not only change the way that his teams were set up, but specifically, what we're gonna talk about today are some changes that he implemented with his meetings and how that helped defeat Al-Qaeda. He wrote a book about it, pretty fascinating book, called Team of Teams, The New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World. And if you geek out on military strategy and you want to hear how special forces operators and a special commander think and some of the leadership strategies that the military used in the war on terror and how surprisingly well they overlap with the construction business, go check out that book, Team of Teams. Here's what was going on back in 2003, 2004. Frankly, we were losing the war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq because, according to General Stanley McChrystal, we were using leadership methods and communication methods that used to work really well against a different enemy, but they just stopped working. Here's what General Stanley McChrystal wrote in his book, Team of Teams. Quote, I'm going to read some excerpts from this book, and then we're going to dig into how you can make You can harness the power of these strategies in your meetings specifically. So here's what General Stanley McChrystal said in his book. The most critical element of our transformation, the heart muscle of the organism we sought to create, and the pulse by which it would live or die, was our operations and intelligence brief. The O and I... O and I, as it was commonly called, Operations and Intelligence Brief, is a standard military practice. It's a regular meeting held by the leadership of a given command to integrate everything the command is doing with everything it knows. So the O and I brief was a standard, standing, regular meeting held by the leadership to integrate everything the command is doing with everything that it knows. Here's what he said Our leadership learned over time to use this forum. Not as a stereotypical military briefing where junior personnel give nicely rehearsed updates and hope for no questions. That's the way it used to be. Instead, it was an interactive discussion 
If an individual had a four minute slot, the update portion would be covered in the first 60 seconds and the remainder of their time would be filled with open ended conversation between the person giving the brief and senior leadership and potentially anyone else on the network if they saw a critical point that had to be made. Instead of these black and white lines of question like how many X, the dialogue became more interactive and broad. Questions like, why are you thinking X? The response to this type of interaction created new insights, it deepened the group's understanding of a complex issue, and it highlighted the deep levels of understanding of our personnel around the globe. So they shifted their meetings away from black and white presentation style where someone was giving information, sharing a well-rehearsed information, and hoping for no questions. And it became more of an interactive discussion. And he goes on to say this, the most important, the most important thing about these meetings, these O and I briefs, is that it allowed all members of the organization to see problems being solved in real time, number one. Number two, to understand the perspective of the senior leadership team. This gave them the skills and the confidence to solve their own similar problems without the need for further guidance or clarification. Let me say that again. The most important thing about these meetings is that it did two things. It allowed all members of the organization to see problems being solved in real time. And number two, to understand how the senior leadership team thought and how the senior leadership team made decisions. This gave everybody on these meetings and on these calls the skills and confidence to solve their own problems without further guidance or clarification. This is a very powerful concept that General Stanley McChrystal called shared consciousness. Shared consciousness. Here's what he went on to say. General McChrystal said, I began to reconsider the nature of my role as a leader. The wait for my approval was not resulting in any better decisions, and our priorities should be reaching the best possible decision that could be made, made in a time frame that allowed it to be relevant. I came to realize that in normal cases, I didn't add tremendous value, so I changed the process. I communicated across the command my thought process on decisions like airstrikes and told them to make the call. Let me say that again. He came to the conclusion that, quote, I did not add tremendous value, so I communicated across the command my thought process. Here's how I think about decisions. And I told them to make the call. Let that sink in for a minute. Instead of telling people what to do and making sure every decision went through him, he taught people how he thought. Instead of telling people what to do, he taught people how to think and then told them to make the call. He went on to say, whoever made the decision, I was always ultimately responsible and more often than not, those below me reached the same conclusion I would have. But this way, our team would be empowered to do what was needed. General McChrystal said the practice of relaying decisions up and down the chain of command is premised on the assumption that the organization has the time to do so, or more accurately, that the cost of the delay is less than the cost of the errors produced by removing a supervisor. Let's pause here. Here's what he said. This is incredibly applicable to the construction industry. He said the practice of relaying decisions up and down the chain of command, running every decision up the flagpole and then orders back down, was premised on the assumption that the organization has time to do so. It was also premised on the assumption that the cost of the delay in waiting for that process to go through is less than the cost of the errors produced by removing a supervisor. In 2004, this assumption no longer held. The risks of acting too slowly were higher than the risks of letting competent people make judgment calls. We concluded that we would be better served by accepting the 70% solution today rather than satisfying protocol and running things up the flagpole and getting the 90% solution tomorrow. 
He said in parentheses, in the military, you learn that you will never have time for the 100% solution. I would say that also applies in construction. You don't have time to wait for the 100% solution. And I'm going to go back to one thing. A lot of you are making the assumption that the cost of, the, of a delay is less than the cost of errors produced by removing a supervisor. That's why everything is going to the boss, because you're ignoring the cost of delay, the, the lost time, the opportunity cost. There's a, a cost of inaction. In the military, that cost of inaction could be that the terrorists got away or someone could be in danger. But in the construction world, the cost of inaction is general conditions are racking up. Customers are getting frustrated. The cost of inaction could be that you lose a good potential hire that goes somewhere else or other things. But there's a cost of inaction. And in many cases, the, the cost of that delay is greater than the cost of the potential mistake that you're trying to avoid. Here's what he said. We concluded that we'd be better served by accepting the what he called the 70% solution today rather than satisfying protocol and getting the 90% solution tomorrow. Here's what he said. I found that, listen to this, see if this applies to you. I found that containing my desire to micromanage, I flipped a switch in my subordinates. They had always taken things seriously, but now they acquired a gravitas that they had not had before. It's one thing to look at a situation and make a recommendation to a senior leader about whether or not to authorize a strike. Psychologically, it's an entirely different experience to be charged with making that decisions. That decision. Junior officers, instead of handing the decision to me and providing guidance, were now entrusted with the responsibility of a decision that was quite literally often a matter of life and death. On the whole, General McChrystal said, our initiative, which we called Empowered Execution, met with tremendous success. Decisions came more quickly, which is critical in a fight where speed was essential to capturing enemies and preventing attacks. More important and more surprising, here's what they found. They found that as speed increased and we pushed authority further down, the quality of the decisions actually went up. Let me say that again. Quote, we found that as speed increased and we pushed authority further down, the quality of decisions actually went up. By pushing the decisions out to the people closest to the problem, not only did the speed increase, but the quality of decisions went up. The general said, we had decentralized on the belief that the 70% solution would be better than the 90% solution tomorrow, but we found that our estimates were backwards. We were getting the 90% solution today instead of the 70% solution tomorrow. He realized they had it backwards. They were thinking, okay, by following the protocol, by running everything up and down the chain of command, we're going to get a 90% solution tomorrow. But you know what? If we speed things up, we'll get a 70% solution and that's good enough. But what they actually found was by using shared consciousness in their meetings and by using empowered execution, they actually got better results. The quality of decisions were, were better and they were faster. So they got the 90% solution today instead of the 70% solution tomorrow. So a key part of shared consciousness of empowered execution. And what we're talking about today, which is how meetings helped defeat Al-Qaeda, was what he called the, let's see, what exactly did he call it? He said the most critical element of our trans transformation, the heart muscle of the organism, the pulse by which it would live or die, was the regular meeting, their operations and intelligence brief. By changing that, changing their approach to that meeting, that was one of the, the the turning points, one of the, the pivotal decisions that General Stanley McChrystal made that tipped the balance of the war against Al-Qaeda. And here's what I found with meetings. Let me know if, uh, if any of this sounds familiar. 
several years ago, I was back when I was running projects for a real estate development company. We're building office buildings, 10, 20 million, $30 million office buildings, industrial distribution centers. And there was this guy, um, we'll call him David because that's his name. And David was a, he, he was a tenant rep that kept showing up on these projects. And he was a pretty experienced guy. But when I heard David say something over and over and over in these meetings, in a meeting, he would say, you know what, I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll, uh, I'll get that to you early next week. And then at the next weekly meeting, hey, David, you said you were going to take care of that. Where are you at with that? And David would say, oh, I'll, I'll get that to you early next week. And then the next week, David, how are you coming along with that? I, I'll get that to you, you guessed it, early next week. So one of the problems I've seen with meetings is that people just don't do anything. They say it, yep, I'll get that to you early next week. Or maybe it's, I'll get that to you in, a, in two weeks. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, and six weeks later, it's still two weeks out. It's still, it's still coming early next week. So here are some other common problems that I've seen in the thousands, literally thousands of hours of meetings that, that I've been involved in. Um, one of the problems is there are companies who would say, you know what, we just, we just don't have meetings. We don't meet. We don't talk about priorities. We just kind of handle everything on the fly. Some of the common problems with meetings would be as follows. We don't have an agenda. We just get together and we start talking about stuff and we go down little rabbit trails and we, we just have no structure. Or we try to cover everything every time. We just try to talk about every project every customer, everything, every time. Another common issue is that we have lots of great ideas. We talk about lots of stuff, but nothing ever changes. There's no implementation. Nobody takes action. Sort of like, David, I'll do that early next week. For a lot of construction business owners who we work with, they'll say things like, uh, well, it's, it's me asking all the questions. I come to the meeting and it feels like I'm pulling information out of my people. And in many cases, the team is unprepared for the meeting. They don't know what is expected of them. They're having to think on the fly. They feel like they're on defense. They're not sure what's going to be asked of them. And they're scrambling for, for answers in the meeting because they don't know. They don't know what to expect. A lot of meetings are all rear view mirror, talking about things that are already done, rehashing things, doing postmortems, spending a lot of time on things that are already in the past. Maybe there's no follow through. As I mentioned, maybe you even have meeting minutes, you have an agenda, but there's no follow through and nothing's actually happening. It could be that you feel like if you're trying to run these meetings, you feel like you're just chasing cats or maybe pushing a rope. If you are a what we would consider a visionary, maybe you are using this time with your team to lay out your your big picture ideas, the 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 thing that you're excited about, this new initiative that that you want to explore, and it's very possible that every week there's a new initiative, and the team just looks at you with a blank look in their eye because they're thinking, here we go again. Here's the idea du jour, the thing that the shiny object that the boss is excited about. So think about this. What are the ripple effects of ineffective meetings? What happens, what happens if you don't solve this? What happens if you don't make your meetings effective or if they continue to deteriorate or continue to be ineffective? Well, number one is just wasted time. When you have your team together, wow, the meter is really spinning. That's incredibly expensive time. And you really need to make the best of that time together with your team meeting. If you don't have good meetings, details will continue to fall through the cracks. Could be what we call starving horse syndrome, which goes back to the old saying, the best way to starve a horse is to have two people feed it. 
People are thinking, oh, I thought you were going to do that, or you said you were going to do that, or you did this last time. So details fall through the cracks, and think about what happens there when details fall through the cracks. You have profit bleeds, schedule delays, frustrated customers. Another ripple effect is that you just continue to carry it all. You are responsible for all the results. You're responsible for pulling information out of people. You're responsible for following up with people, holding them accountable to do things. You're delegating tasks. And as you think about growing your team, like, well, that's just one more person that I have to keep up with. And it probably feels like you're pushing a rope. I know I've certainly felt that way. It feels like I'm pushing a rope, trying to get someone to do something. Sometimes it feels like they're actively resisting that. And it's very possible that they are. If your meetings are not effective and your team's not bringing you good information, then you're at risk of making decisions based on partial information or bad information. You're at risk of making bad decisions. If your meetings are not effective, people will find ways not to attend. They'll give you excuses. They'll find a way not to come because it feels like a waste of time. Maybe because it is a waste of time. You may just end up not having meetings, just saying, forget it. We're not going to have meetings. And then what happens? If you have a team of any size and you're not meeting to discuss details, what, what's going to happen then? Think about this. What, what will this do to your team? If your, your meetings are ineffective, the time you're spending isn't well, it's not good, a good use of time. What will that do to your team? How are your meetings or lack of meetings affecting your team now? Do they feel like they're in the dark? Do they feel like they're being blindsided? Do they feel like they're being called onto the carpet every time and they're getting frustrated? And then think about how this will affect you. If every decision goes through you, if you have to ask all the questions, if you're carrying all the results and you're delegating tasks, how will you ever be able to step away from your business? How will you ever be able to operate as a CEO? How will you ever be able to take a two-week vacation or be able to sell your business sometime? So let me give you some best practices for construction team meetings. If you're wondering, all right, I, I'm, I like this idea of shared consciousness. I like this idea of empowered execution, but uh, that sounds great for the military, but we're not running a special forces. We're not running a special operations command over here fighting terrorists. Although sometimes it might feel like your customers are terrorists. How do you actually do this? How do you run effective construction team meetings? Okay, I'll give you some best practices, again, that I've developed and gleaned from sitting through thousands of hours of meetings, most of which sucked and were ineffective. So number one, this is, I'm assuming you're a construction business owner. I'm assuming that you are leading a team. If you are running this meeting, okay, you're running a project meeting, running a business, number one, you establish what the MIT list is. The list of the most important things for the next four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. What are the big picture objectives? the most important things. You publish that and share that with your team regularly. And here's one of the biggest shifts in the meeting is that updates and reports should be completed by the person who's accountable for them and sent out the day before the meeting. Okay, let me say this again. This is a complete 180 degree shift, completely different way of doing meetings. Instead of People showing up at the, at the meeting, getting ready to play defense, waiting to see what's asked of them. People who are accountable for updates and reports push that information to everybody else who's going to attend that meeting the day before the meeting. Okay. Number three, meeting time should be spent reviewing questions, concerns, or issues about the information that was already sent out. Meeting time should be spent reviewing questions, concerns, or issues about the information. Having those insightful questions. How do you think about this? What about this? Helping people think through the issues. Number four, the, the meeting should stay focused on answering questions like, what does the entire team need to know about? What does everybody else need to know about? 
And then another good question is, what do you need help with? What does the entire team need to know about and what do you need help with? Number five would be avoid using meeting time, looking at information or discussing information for the first time. Avoid using meeting time, looking at or discussing information for the first time. That's not useful. Number six is to set a start time and set a finish time. Have bookends on your meeting. Let everybody know up front, we're going to start on time. The expectation is that everybody's there early and we're going to finish at a certain time. That requires number seven, which is to have an agenda, a detailed agenda with blocks of time. We will start at 10 a.m. And at 10.05, we'll talk about this topic. At 10.15, we'll talk about this. At 10.30, we'll talk about this. So have an agenda and work really hard to keep the sections of the meeting on pace. Number eight, if an issue can be solved with a conversation between two people, discuss it outside the meeting. This would be a sidebar discussion that pops up in a meeting and somebody needs to be facilitating the meeting, calling time out. Hey, how about you guys, you gals, you people, take that offline, discuss that outside the meeting. Here are two that often get missed. Even if there's an agenda, if we have the right people at the table, there's two final things that are incredibly important. Number nine, have a way to track action items. Have a way to track action items. Where will these action items live? And if you're thinking, we do meeting minutes, that's great. But where, what's even better than meeting minutes would be some sort of a to-do in your software. Calendar, the slot on the calendar. Some way to track these action items so that you can check in with people, that it'll show up on their dashboard that they need to do things. And then speaking of action items, here's a great way to to actually get stuff done is at the end of the meeting, have everyone spend 15 minutes working on their action items at the end. So if you wanna have a 60 minute meeting, book 75 minutes for the meeting, one hour of meeting time, 15 minutes of action items. Because human nature, what typically happens is people bounce, especially people who bounce from meeting to meeting. They whip out their notebook. They write down what they're going to do. And then they, at the end of the meeting, they fold up the notebook. They jump in the truck, go to the next meeting, go to lunch, go to the next thing. And that action item just hangs there and gets forgotten about. And then you end up like David at the next meeting. Hey, David, how's it going with that? And you say, oh, I'll get that to you early next week. First part of next week, right? So have a way to track action items and then create space for your team to spend the last 15 minutes working on action items at the end of the meeting. So think about this. Picture this. Picture this situation. You have people accountable for each of the major functions of your business. This is if you own a construction business, okay? You have someone, one person who's accountable for each of the major functions of the business. You have people who you can delegate results to, not just delegate tasks. Imagine that everybody on your team understands the goals, they understand the big picture objectives, and they're all pulling together. Imagine that your leaders are planning what they need to do to accomplish those results. They are sending updates out to you each week, sharing them with the rest of the team before the team meeting. Every week you meet with your team and they review their plans. They are working together to coordinate details. It's not all going through you, but they're coordinating together about sharing resources, working out issues, asking each other questions, holding people holding each other accountable. And then you are facilitating the meeting and leading your team. You have these, this structure and this process in place and things just get done. Things get done without you having to push 
without you having to feel like you're pushing ropes, without you having to follow up and badger people. Maybe things are getting done without you even being involved. How great would that be if things just got done and you found out after the fact, hey, this thing got taken care of. So think about this. How would this affect, how would this affect your team when you have all of these things happen? When the team feels trusted, when they're empowered to make decisions, they have access to the information they need, and they are em- you're using empowered execution, you're pushing decision-making out to people, you have this culture of accountability. Think about this. Will they be more likely to take action on things or less likely to take action when you're running your meetings this way? Will they be more likely to make decisions or less likely to make decisions? Think about that. And then let's talk about you. How does this affect you? Let's say your meetings are running like this. You have shared consciousness going on. Everybody on the team understands the priorities. You're using empowered execution. The team is is making decisions based on the priorities. Think about how does this affect you? Will you have more time each week? What will this do to the number of phone calls and emails and texts that you get every week from your team? Think about this. Here's a question I like to ask people. If you had four hours a week, four hours a week to work on something high value in your business, what would you do with that? How would you spend those four hours a week? Uninterrupted block of four hours a week that you knew you could work on doing deep work. What would that do for you? And then what what would that do for the business? What would be the ripple effects of that in your business? So if you want your team meetings to run like this, here are, here are a few next steps. If that sounds good to you, there are three things that you'll want to do first that you want to lay the groundwork for. Number one, you need to clearly define roles and responsibilities, okay? Clearly define who is accountable for what results. You'll need to establish what are the major functions of your business, how is accountability divided up? And who's the person accountable for each of those major functions and those results? And the single best way that we found to do that is to design your accountability chart for two years in the future. This is very different than just drafting an organizational chart around the people you currently have. You need to design your accountability chart so your business is set up and designed just the way you want it to run. And then second, you need to have documented processes, okay? And the the lead domino here, the thing you'll want to start with is to design and document your process to do what we call nail the handoff from the office to the field. You need to nail the handoff from the office to the field. This is a disciplined and documented process that maps out every step of the pre-construction process. And when you do this, when you nail the handoff from the office to the field, this is going to eliminate the majority of the chaos and the profit leads and the schedule delays and the frustration on your job sites. It is absolutely the lead domino. If you're looking for the 80 for the 20, the 20% of the steps in your process that you can focus on that will give you 80% of the results, nailing the handoff is absolutely the place to start. And then the third thing you'll want to do is to implement the leadership systems that your team will use to convert your goals into reality, okay? Implement leadership systems. Systems like someone needs to be planning tomorrow's work today. Someone needs to be preparing two-week look-ahead schedules for every project. Someone needs to be establishing that MIT list, the most important things for the business or the project for the next six to eight weeks, and then the weekly team meeting. Those are leadership systems. Those are the tools in the toolbox for your leaders to convert your goals into reality. So those are three crucial systems that you want to put in place if you want to have team meetings that run like this. The accountability chart, nail the handoff, and leadership systems. So here's the thing. You can obviously figure all of this stuff out on your own through trial and error. You certainly do that. 
You could spend months experimenting. Try try it out. Try it out on a project. Try out, try out a, a meeting agenda for a few months. See if it works. Meanwhile, continuing to deal with the chaos, profit bleeds, and scheduled delays and frustration. Or if you want to accelerate your results and you want you're a fan of avoiding learning curve, avoiding months or years, thousands of dollars that come along with the learning curve, not to mention mistakes, then one of the best things you can do is to find a proven system and use it, okay? One of the best things you can do is simply find a proven system and use it. It's the same reason why you use QuickBooks instead of writing your own software. It's the same reason you use CoConstruct or Builder Trend or Procore or Red Team instead of going out and writing and creating your own software from scratch. Like, yeah, you could probably do that. You could probably write your own software, hire programmers, all of that stuff, spend years and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars figuring it out on your own, making cost of mistakes. So you could spend a lot of time and energy Reinventing that wheel when you can just take advantage of the years of work that somebody else has already done. And the reason you don't build your own software, it's probably the same reason why you don't own a concrete plant or a lumber mill. It's why you work with trade partners who are specialists at their trade instead of self-performing everything. It's the reason you don't manufacture your own windows. You don't manufacture your own siding. You let somebody else who has already invested the time already invested the capital, let them build it, and then you get to use it when you need it. And that's why, frankly, most successful professionals invest in a proven system. That's why they invest in coaching, whether they're professional tennis players, professional race car drivers, professional CrossFit athletes, NFL quarterbacks, CEOs, professional pitchers. That's why they invest in coaching, because coaching will bring three things. A proven system, it allows you to just take advantage of that proven system. It also brings new ideas that you would likely not have thought of otherwise. And it also brings accountability. Accountability. You get access to a proven system that you can just plug into your business without spending years to figure it out on your own. New ideas. You'll have access to a team of coaches who work with construction business owners from all over the world who will share ideas and best practices that you simply may not have been exposed to. And then let's face it, when you're the boss, nobody's looking over your shoulder, right? That's why you need accountability to drive implementation. And as a bonus, if you can do all of that in a community of other construction business owners, that's, that's even better. That's a bonus. And that's what an investment in a proven system, an investment in a coaching program will do for you. Guys, look, trying to figure this stuff out by trial and error is crazy. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes years. And there's just a better way. Here's the good news. You can get the results you want without having to recreate the wheel or without having, having to figure it all out by yourself. Okay? An investment in the right coaching program will pay for itself in a month. Don't Go it alone. You don't have to figure it out all by yourself. So here's my advice. Find the best coaching program out there who has a proven system and is a good fit for you. That's incredibly important. You need to find somebody who's a good fit for you and then invest what it takes to work with them. If you'd like our help putting those crucial systems in place in your business, designing your accountability chart, designing your nail the handoff process, and putting those proven leadership systems in place so that your business can run without you, so that you can take a two-week vacation and leave your laptop at home, so that your phone just won't ring nearly as much, so that long-term you can sell the business someday. If you'd like our help doing that, then I would invite you to go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply and schedule the breakthrough session with our team. That's constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply, A-P-P-L-Y. Okay, up next is an interview with David Hopkins, owner of Riverbrook Builders, a custom home builder serving North Carolina's coastal regions. 
Our director of customer success, Leah Valgardson, sat down with David to discuss his experience with putting some of those crucial systems in place in his business. Here's that conversation with David and Leah. I'm Todd DeWalt, and be sure to listen to this interview, and I'll see you next time. All right, David, thank you so much for joining me today. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the business? Absolutely. So I have a semi-custom, custom home building business, coastal North Carolina, and um, we've been building here for the last five years, specializing primarily on retirees. And um, over the last few years, we've grown the business and got to a point where uh, it was almost uh, it was almost a breaking point. Tell me a little bit about that. What was that like for you, that breaking point? And how were things yeah, uh, before lot, you found the problem? A lot of, lot of lost sleep. Things were very much overwhelming. We were kind of um, growing, I don't want to say we were growing too quickly, but we didn't have the necessarily appropriate processes in, in place and found that things were getting missed. Mm. Um, we were having a lot of project slippage where, you know, we were missing certain costs or we would have gray areas where you you don't really know if it's something that you should cover or if you should um, if the homeowner should pay for it. And oftentimes you would just cover it instead. And so mm-hmm. it was just kind of this snowball effect. And um, it impacted a lot of things for us. It impacted definitely our, our days under construction for most of our builds and, and ultimately our bottom line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That, that always hurts when it affects the bottom line, doesn't it? It hurts the most. <laughs> so you already kind of shared a few things with with bottom mm-hmm. line, lost sleep, if, you know, things slipping through the cracks and doing a lot of, uh, you know, kind of charitable work, quite frankly, <laughs> for your clients. Uh, were much. those, yeah, were those some of the main problems that you were having before you found and joined the SYCB program? Yeah, th- those were the main problems. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that, that we had structure, um, mm-hmm. but it was it was structured chaos probably is the best words to use where we, we had certain things in place, but the execution of these things were, weren't really working. And it it was hard. It was hard putting a finger on what that was. I just, we, we knew that things were not working the way they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that frustration like for you? Oh, it was terrible. I mean, it just, it, it weighed on you constantly. So, you know, as the owner of the company, I was doing, I felt like I was doing just about everything and multiple people in the company were kind of doing the same thing and, and roles were overlapped, working lots of hours through the weekends, waking up at night. And that's really, that's really all I thought about Constantly on your mind, lots of lost constantly sleep, more. constantly working. That sounds exhausting, <laughs> quite frankly. It it was. Yeah. Oh goodness, I can imagine. So that was life before. Then you joined the SYCB program. What at what point in the program did you think, wow, I think this is really going to work. This is going to help us. Yeah, you know, for for me, it, it's hard to put my finger necessarily on one particular thing. I, the the way the program is structured from the very beginning. And just the way you schedule work for the week, having a new outlook on what I'm allocating time towards. I mean, that that's kind of the basis of, of where we started and, and the building blocks for what we built on. But the the accountability chart, nail the handoff, uh, the nail the handoff was probably the most impactful for our team and was was very eye opening for us. Mm-hmm. And um that that is one that we immediately dug into, but there there's all there's all kinds of little nuggets in the program that, that um, we've we've been able to to implement, and it's really we've had some profound changes being made, and and ultimately the quality of life and, and the outlook of the company is completely different. Wow, that's fantastic news. Uh, and I appreciate that you brought up some of the foundational pieces that we introduce, which one of them is the CEO schedule. And that's what you're referring to in that we really ask you to to look at your calendar and create a schedule that is most ideal for you to be able to work on your business, for you to block out time for that and to reorganize your time and your energy in a way that's more effective. 
Uh, and one of the things that I appreciated from that, not only did you pick that up and run with it, but you encouraged your team to as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how that has helped you and your team? Yeah, I, I found that because I had these certain blocks of time on my schedule allocated to certain things, it, it was really helping me focus on that and not feel like I have to do all these other things at the same time. So that that is kind of the biggest that, that was the biggest eye opener for me that, OK, I, I can focus on this one task and I don't have to answer my phone. Mm-hmm. Um, I may have a time allocated for that where it's it's outside of this of this space. And it, it helped me a lot. And then I, I started introducing it to our team, especially as we were progressing in the program to allocate time to focus on certain areas of the program that, that they were implementing. And it, it's helped them as well. I mean, we, everybody's been able to allocate that that time. And by, by allocating time and focusing on one particular part of the program, it, it opens up all this other availability in this kind of a weird way. You end up having more free time by eliminating some of the multitasking. Yeah, you're not so scattered. You're able to really focus and Part of that is eliminating your distractions, which it sounds like you did. You gave yourself permission to not answer your phone (laughs) and probably to not answer emails and and to block out that time and your team as well, which I think is really, that's key. Um, I want to hear a little bit more. You said that nail the handoff was also really big for you and your team. What about that made such a difference for you? Yeah, I think that not everybody realized everything going into that process or we didn't have a clear vision of what it took to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And by having the entire team there to help map that process out, it it was really, it it was eye opening. And um, everybody got to kind of share their thoughts and feelings of what, what worked, what didn't work, what we uh, needed to implement that we currently weren't. Mm -hmm. And it's not often that, that you, get all that feedback in in a, in a situation like that. And Mm -hmm. that, that for us was, was very, very impactful in in analyzing what we needed to do, where we needed to go and and how we needed to get there. Mm -hmm. That's great. That really was my next question was which, which parts of the program are most impactful or beneficial? Uh, Is there anything more that you want to share? I know you already said nail the handoff was. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think, I think every part of the program, like like a like I said earlier, there there's there's these building blocks you guys put in place, and and every part of the program has something that's kind of instrumental to the next part of the program, mm-hmm. and th- this is something that we're we're still working on. I mean, there there's quite a few things that we we will be implementing over the next six plus months. You know, we're we're just at the beginning here, but. Every part of the program had had very valuable pieces for us and kind of built on itself. The, the accountability chart was was another one where it, it really broke things down in a way that we could analyze what fit where and mm-hmm. and, and also trying to plug that into the uh, now the handoff. So it's we, we really found a lot. Almost everything in the program was just kind of it built on itself and it was all very valuable. No, I'm really happy to hear that. And that is a couple of things that you said in there that I appreciate is we often say trust the process as you're going through this. And that is, those are the building blocks, right? It's been designed in a very intentional way. So you're starting out with those foundational things to get you organized. And then as information is released, it just builds on top of the next piece or the next piece builds upon the previous piece. And then the second part of that is it's a lot of information in eight weeks. And it won't be done it in eight is. weeks. <laughs> There's still work to be done. But uh, now you have a game plan. Now you have direction. And now you have the tools and the training available to continue to move forward and to see these changes in your business, which uh, we we love that. We love the results and can't wait to hear how things continue to progress for you guys. Now that you've gone through the program, uh, and of course, you still have things you want to implement, but how is life different for you now versus where it was eight, 10 weeks ago? Yeah, so... The, the the sleep thing has improved greatly. There's there's no more right. two a.m. wake ups, but but no, I mean the the biggest thing is there there's a lot less chaos, right? So we we've now mapped out how everything needs to run. I mean we we have the systems in place, 
we, we may be missing some parts and pieces as we continue to build on that. But the, the framework is there and we've been able to implement um, different facets of the program within everybody, with everybody in our company. And um, we, we've seen huge improvements and we're not even halfway through implementing the um, the, the tools that, that you guys provided for us. So uh, I'm very optimistic and uh, excited about what's to come over the next few few months and um, very, very confident that uh, we're heading in the right direction. Awesome. Well, we're excited to hear how things continue to go too. We love, uh, we love to see all of these things go into place and results. That's really what we're here for. So happy to hear that you're already seeing some great results and have, of course, plans to have even better results in the future. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap things up? No, I just, I, I really appreciate everything you guys have, have done for us. It, it was a, uh, it was a very valuable experience for us and, you know, we're, we're really excited about, about the, the remainder of this, of this year. And, um, and, and getting everything everything ironed out in our, in our company. So awesome. thank you. Very much. Very, very pleased to be here and to have taken you through this. So thank you, David.